You're listening to Food for Thought, the OFM podcast, brought to you by Vespa. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Food for Thought, the OFM podcast. And today's guest is Lyle Anderson, a race director with Vacation Races. And the reason Lyle's coming on today is because he and his team are, are really kind of one of the leading race group organizers uh, in the country right now because um, they were able to host a 100-mile uh, in May, early May. Uh, my, um, Lyle, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate you having me. Yep, yep, yep. Now, it was, it was the Bryce Canyon 100, and that was in early to mid-May, right? It was right around May 12th or 13th? No, it was late May. It was May, uh, May 29th and 30th. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Got that one completely off. But it was, it was in May. Um, yeah. And we're two and a half months down the road now. Correct. So I'm sure that was, shall we say, interesting to get that, make that go. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of, uh, you know, prior to, us making the decision to go ahead with that one, we had had to cancel several of our other races. And so the, the last race that we had done prior to Bryce was our Antelope Canyon ultra, which was, uh, March, uh, March 14th. And oh, that was right. probably, yeah, that was probably the last race that had been held in the country prior to all this stuff and this COVID uh craziness and then uh bryce was probably the first one to oh, happen wow. after all this stuff so it's kind of so we kind of got to be the last and the first to to uh to jump back into the uh the racing world and, and try and tackle some of these uh these new uh, obstacles that got put in front of us yeah yeah and 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 there are obstacles for everybody because i mean you, you have to work sure. with ag agencies and uh partners and as well as the uh, people who are signing up for these races. So it's a challenge all around. That's what we want to talk about today. So we can, you know, um, give some insight to the listeners, especially the the endurance athlete listeners out there who are uh, kind of sitting out there in limbo. Well, 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 guess what? So are all these race organizers. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, how we can find a path to getting this going, because certainly you guys have been successful in, in, in getting races going. And we want to kind of see how we can move that needle and get, get races on the board that people are going to sign up for without fear of, of them uh, getting canceled. And then the whole maybe refund, maybe not refund uh, yeah. process and the frustration that everybody goes through. So, um, I guess we we need we need to back up and start about start at Antelope. Um, that you guys had that made a go of that right when the lockdown was happening. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it was it was kind of crazy because that week I was I was preparing for that race and uh, and starting you know earlier in that week I started hearing of all these races that were canceling, and I remember I remembered hearing of, of one here in Utah. Uh, that had canceled and I was like, oh, that sucks because they were the, their post was that the health department uh, pulled their permits and wasn't going to allow them to do it. And I was like, oh, that really sucks. And I wasn't even thinking that that was a, that that was even a possibility for our race of, of having that happen. I was just kind of thinking that was pretty unfortunate for them. And then uh, as we got closer and closer to the race that, that weekend, uh, I started hearing of other races that were getting canceled and and started making me a little bit nervous. And then the, the day before the race, uh, so that, that race that we do in Antelope Canyon, it's, uh, primarily on, uh, Navajo nation, uh, land. And so we, we permit through a few different agencies, but, uh, but one of the agencies we permit through is the, uh, the Navajo, uh, parks and rec department that, uh, that, that, uh, permits a lot of the uh, slot canyon tours that they do in and around page through like antelope canyon and horseshoe bend and and so on and and uh and i had caught wind from uh, from one of our from one of our runners who's a uh member of the navajo nation uh he was there at the expo that morning and he came up and said oh yeah did you hear they they shut down all the slot canyons this morning they made an announcement they're closing down all the slot canyon tours and i was like no i hadn't i hadn't heard that 
And he's like, yeah, so I don't know what that means for you guys. And unfortunately, on Friday, because that's on a Friday, and on Fridays, uh, their office was closed anyways. And uh, aside from that, um, the lady who, who issued our permits was was uh, she was she was not even in town because she was attending this meeting where they were trying to discuss what they were going to do as far as closing down these these uh, slot canyons and uh, and shutting the tours down altogether. And so I hadn't been able to get a hold of anybody and hadn't heard uh, any anything contrary to us being able to do the event. I had the permit, but nobody had told me that they were pulling my permit. So I was like, well. Uh, I'm just going to proceed as if there's nothing going on because I haven't been told otherwise. And so, but all day I was pretty nervous that whole day we had our, our expo going on there in, in page and, and uh, you know, and, and this was still fairly, fairly, you know, in its infancy as far as like understanding what, uh, what the, the risks and the dangers were associated with it. So I think a lot of people were just kind of like more or less, mm, kind of spooking themselves out a little bit. And, and so we had a lot of late minute, you know, last minute cancellations and stuff uh, with the race, people, people calling in or people n- unable to even get, uh, get on a plane to make it out there. So we had a lot of people from out of the country that weren't able to attend. And a lot of people from, uh, from the East coast that weren't able to make it out because flights were getting canceled. And so it was kind of a crazy day. A lot, a lot was going on. A lot of things were up in the air and, uh, and, um, and, and I didn't even know if if, uh, if I was going to be able able to do the event because I hadn't been told otherwise um, from the tribal park. And uh, I got a call that night at 6 p.m. from the tribal office, and uh, they they said, "You're probably wondering, uh, you, or you probably heard we were clo- we closed down all the the slot canyon tours." Is like, yeah, I heard. And uh, she's like, "You're probably you're wondering what that means for your event, aren't you?" And I'm like. Yeah, that's uh, it's kind of been, uh, you know, thought has crossed my mind a few times today. And uh, she says, well, since your event's tomorrow, we're going to go ahead and let you guys do it. So I was super grateful that we were allowed to continue with our event. But but literally, if our event had been one day later, uh, I, I don't think it would have happened. So we were pretty fortunate in that uh, in that regard to be able to continue on with the event and uh and it was a great event and uh you know again to well, what to was the knowledge. what what was the distance and how many participants or how many participants in each distance we had so uh off the top of my head i can't remember how many participants in each distance we had we had a 100 mile a 50 mile a 55k and a half marathon oh, wow. and i want to say that, i want to say the 100 mile we started out with just over 100 the 50 mile we started out with um around oh i want to say is around 250 250 participants in that one and the 55k was about the same and then the half marathon i i think we had uh about 500 in that in that one so you probably had an aggregate of over a thousand participants plus family crew etc yeah, we were we were expecting over two thousand between all the distances. So that just goes to show you how many people backed out last minute for that one. So uh, I wasn't I wasn't uh, you know upset that that many people had had backed out. You know, it definitely made it easier to keep everybody uh, socially distanced uh, under those under those circumstances and stuff. But uh, but definitely. Uh, definitely was a lot less than what we were expecting. So, so, so you guys ran that as a star, standard ultra with the standard aid station, buffet style aid station. Yep. yep. Correct. Uh, Correct. Everything. So, okay, let's, yeah. let's, let's dive into the aftermath. Was there? Yeah. The, no, no, nothing. Uh, the, the only, the only aftermath, which, which, which really didn't have anything to do with, with our event, at least not that I've been able to link back. I haven't heard from any of our runners that have gotten sick, but, the Navajo Nation was greatly impacted um, uh, with with the COVID. Uh, COVID cases on the reservation. They they've been hit really really hard, uh, and and I don't know exactly what the the primary cause to that that is. I know that um, you know they 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 operate a lot of tours where they were. Um, kind of catering to a lot of the foreign tourists that were coming through. So. Um, 
I, I think that that probably had a great deal of impact on uh, on where their their numbers were spiking from. But but again, I, I don't know. But I uh, to kind of reiterate, I, I am not aware of any of our runners uh, contracting it uh, to the best of my knowledge. So well, and especially contracting it via the race um, with everybody there. Yeah, for sure. Now, for now sure. I think that's that's really important information listeners out there endurance athletes listeners out there a race was held with like a thousand participants or more maybe a thousand to twelve hundred uh their crews their families pacers um so we're talking about a a, a gathering uh of 1500 people would you say yeah yeah and that was yeah and that was before we even had any sort of restrictions on on crew and pacers, uh, you know, at aid stations and things like that. So, uh, and, and also at the finish line, like we had, we had asked people, you know, like, you know, try not to congregate, but, but, uh, but we weren't doing anything to try and police that. So there was a lot of congregating. So, so what, it, besides the lower turnout, which, which actually for an ultra, that's pretty big. What, what did that look like? It looked like a, I'm imagining it looked like a, a normal ultra, the, this An- Antelope Canyon one. Yeah, as I say, it, it, the, I, the the biggest the biggest difference with it was just the 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 unknowns that uh, that everybody you know participants and us as race organizers kind of went into it with is like you know there's a lot of there's a lot of talk going on around that time and there's just a lot of fear you know like I I had a lot of fear myself you know this is when we were going through the the crazy toilet paper crisis. And I remember um, talking to, well, the owner of the company, uh, Salem Stanley, he was, uh, he was in an event the week before down in Costa Rica. Cause we, we do these international races now too. And so uh, he was down in Costa Rica the week before Antelope Canyon doing an event. And, uh, and I called him a couple days before, cause he also kind of manages our composting toilets that we do for all of our races. And so I called him, uh, while he was down in Costa Rica, and I said, "Hey, I hope you have toilet paper because you can't buy it anywhere right now." And uh, he's like, "Yeah, I got plenty. Why? What's going on?" And so, like, I had to explain to him the whole toilet paper shortage crisis that was going on. The, pa- like, the he panic. Had no idea. The panic. Yeah, the the pan the panic. You can't buy toilet paper. He's like, "Yeah, I got plenty of hand sanitizer and toilet paper because he he stocked up on it for for our for composting race. toilets, anyway." Right, so right, right. so. No, he didn't even stock up enough for the race. He just stocked up on it just because, you know, so it was just, it was, it was good that, that we had it, but, uh, um, it was just little things like that, that we, uh, that we were pretty fortunate that we, you know, went into that race, you know, um, kind of, uh, prepared like that's, I, I always, I always tell all my crew, I'm like, some of the things that we go over may seem redundant at times and they are, but I hope that through this redundancy, when when we get to the race on race weekend, all this stuff just becomes you know muscle memory at that point, and we just do it because it's so redundant in our minds and stuff. And and so that's kind of one thing that we we try to pride ourselves on is is kind of harping over the same things over and over again. So hopefully, come race weekend, we're prepared, even if we feel like we aren't. And uh, and I think that definitely uh, play you know came into a came into play for for this particular event where where we had a lot of of new things that we're having to kind of adjust to and stuff yeah yeah that's an important point not only for putting on a race because you don't have a a walmart or a costco to run to in places like page arizona so easily you know especially when you're out on the navajo nation and and same thing for athletes i think that's germane because that's why we do training and we treat you know, with, with what we're doing with our OFM program, we try to teach people to be intuitive, meaning, you know, you, you train with awareness, but you make that a habit so that come race day, you're not thinking about it. And, and, and one of the worst things you got you can do and is, and is a recipe for disaster, whether you're putting on the race or in the race, is try to track every little detail on that day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, um, so, again, a sp- Speaking about reiterating, we're going to reiterate no cases of COVID came out of that race as far as you know, and you probably would know if, if, if there yeah, was a Yeah, for cluster. sure. If, if I, yeah, I would think that if somebody got it, I would have gotten some pretty angry emails from somebody. And I, 
I have not gotten any of those. So. Okay, okay. So let's fast forward two and a half months to the end of May, and a whole new world uh, has emerged. <laughs> yeah, uh, literally. So, so now, now you've you've been shut down for a couple of months and working with permitting agencies, et cetera, to put this on. And, and let's, let's talk about what it all looked like. So it was interesting because we had gotten, we, we had a whole, our, our month of June is, is jam packed with events. We have events every weekend in June and uh, we had, we had had to cancel, we'd had to cancel one of our global adventure races in Iceland uh, towards the tail end of June, we had to cancel our glacier half marathon, the, uh, the end of June. And, uh, and, and those two races kind of came before, uh, canceling those two races kind of came before we even had to cancel, uh, our Yellowstone half marathon and our Grand Teton half marathon, which are the first two weekends in June. Now, now, and, t- uh, t- 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 so tell me these were canceled because permitting agencies pulled the plug. Permitting on agencies. Yeah. So the, the wasn't, black wasn't, feet, uh, it wasn't your decision. It, was, it wasn't you guys' decision. It was based on permitting agency decisions. It, so, yeah. So, so Glacier was the first one we had to cancel and that was our la- that was the last weekend in June. And we had to cancel that because that one is, is on Blackfeet reservation land and they had made the decision to cancel all public gatherings for the entire year. So, so we had to cancel that one before we even had to cancel um, our, our Teton and Yellowstone races. And uh, and Yellowstone, we we had to cancel because they had a mandatory uh, mandatory quarantine order in place, which meant that anybody traveling into the state had to self quarantine for 14 days before they could do anything else. Which, you know, for anybody traveling from out of state, which which is the most the majority of our runners you know, would have to show up 14 days before they could even do the event and self quarantine, which that, that doesn't work either. And then, uh, and then, and then uh, Teton, it was the same, same situation. They just didn't have, they didn't have, um, um, they didn't have the, the insight to give us. And we wanted to give all of our runners at least a 35 day no, uh, notice ahead of time so that they could cancel their reservations and get their money back if possible. And so that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to do what was right for our runners and, uh, and, and make sure that we were giving them the best opportunity they could to not lose out on money and, and stuff that they, that they were already most likely going to be, be out of. And so, um, so we, we kind of had to make those decisions a little far in advance. And, and in hindsight, we, we probably could have done both of those events, uh, Teton and Yellowstone anyways, just because uh, the, the state government uh, agencies had kind of lifted some of those restrictions, but they, they had not been lifted prior to that 35-day window, uh, which we had told all of our, our runners that, uh, that we would make sure we gave them at least 35 day. Uh, heads up notice on that. So, so we had to cancel those. And so it was kind of weird coming into uh, making a decision on Bryce because uh, it's just different, you know, doing the ultras, it's easier for us to stagger, um, to spread out the event and to kind of, and, and make sure that everybody is, is not so congested on the trails and stuff. And, and our numbers were lower because of people that had requested refunds and um and so you know i felt like going into bryce you know we had we had about 600 people that were actively registered when we made the decision and so um i i talked to the the landowner and he was fine with with the event happening uh and then i talked to the forest service and and she just had she just had one question for me she's just like well these are the these are the social distancing guidelines. You know, uh, no more than fifty people gathered at one time, and uh, and need to maintain a six feet uh, um, distance between them. Is that something that you think you can do? And I says, yeah, I, I think we can. You know, like we'll just have to kind of change how we how we do the event. But uh, but I but I really feel confident that that we can do that. And and. To be honest, when I called her, I was more or less like calling her, kind of hoping she would make the decision for me. You know, if she 
if she was absolutely no way we can't we can't permit this then it, it makes it makes it a lot easier for me to go to everybody and say okay this is this is where we're at but that's uh that's not what she did she she basically just said well uh if if you are confident that you can do this then i don't see any reason why you can't do the event and so that was where we had to really kind of put our heads together and try to get creative with with how we can change the event and still keep it within, you know, keep everybody within those guidelines, uh, keep, make it a safe event and still an enjoyable event for everyone that's, that's participating. And so, um, we, uh, the, the first thing that we looked at as far as changing was the expo because the expo is, is obviously the, the biggest, uh, the biggest place where people are going to congregate and just kind of hang around. So we did away with the expo, um, and uh, we just we just offered a drive up bid pickup service only, which worked out really well. Uh, we just had a big field, uh, it's a big farmer's field that we uh, that we used, and um, everybody just drove in on one end of the field, and we had our had our 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 bid pickup tents set up. Uh, it was kind of a big horseshoe basically, so they came in on one side, got to about the the top of the the bend in the horseshoe is where all the bibs were. And we just, they just stayed in their cars. They pulled up, we handed them their bibs. And then as they were exiting, if they had drop bags, they could, they could throw their drop bags out and we organized them for them uh, to get the drop bags taken out of the aid stations. And then the following morning on race day, that was the other, that was the other piece of the puzzle that we really had to, to try and uh, adjust is, you know, mass starts, you know, we can't have a mass start. We can't have everybody all congregating around a start line. Uh, and, and, and keep them, you know, socially distanced from each other and, and whatnot. And so we, we broke it down into, into starting, uh, timeframes. So the hundred milers had from 5.00 AM to 6.00 AM. There's just an open rolling start. So from starting at 5.00 AM, anybody that was towing the line, uh, going for overall awards, we recommended that they started at five anybody who is worried about cutoff times because the cutoff times were based off of the end of that, that starting window. So the cutoff times were actually start based off of somebody starting at 6 AM. So if somebody was worried about cutoff times, if they started closer to five, then they essentially got uh, an extra hour to make those cutoffs. They didn't get an extra hour overall to make their, to make the, to finish the race, but they got an extra hour to make the cutoff times. So, um, so some people were, were very eager to, to get a, a head start. And, uh, and, and so anybody slower, uh, was able to start right after those, uh, those guys going for overall. And then, uh, and then any time after that they had until six to start. And so it was just kind of a, a pretty chilled, uh, you know, laid back atmosphere. We actually had a, uh, an FM, uh, radio tuner, uh, hooked up to our, our, our sound system. So we just made announcements letting everybody. So everybody could just stay in their car. We had a sign that said, tune into this radio station and listen for race announcements. And so we just, as we made race announcements, if they had tuned into that radio station on their cars, they could hear the announcements. And, uh, and so they would know when it was a good time for them to get out of their car and, you know, and, and make their way over to the starting line. And so it just kind of kept it, uh, kept the congregate and the starting line down. There was, there was no, uh, we, strongly discouraged any uh, spectators from hanging around the start line. Um, and for the most part, people were very, uh, uh, you know, runners were very supportive and uh, cooperative with the, uh, the precautionary measures that we were taking in place. I didn't ever have anybody fighting me or complaining about not being able to do this or do that. They were very, uh, you know, cooperative and, and, and I greatly appreciated that because it's, it, you know, it wasn't something I wanted to do. It was just definitely something that we felt like an obligation that we needed to try and do our best. We need to put our best foot forward and try and make sure that we were, that we were showing our runners and the, the, the local community that we were taking this seriously and that we cared about everybody's safety. And so, um, so we did that. And then for, so each, each, uh, distance, we actually had five distances that we ran at, at Bryce. We had a hundred mile, we had a 50 mile, we had a 60 K a 50 K and a 30 K. And so it was spread out, uh, the, each of those distances had an hour starting window. 
And then one other thing that we did um, to try and keep um, uh, keep the you know the congregating down at the aid stations and whatnot is we we allowed everybody to have one pacer. Um, anybody that was doing the hundred mile or the fifty mile, they were allowed to have one pacer, and. And then, and, and at first we weren't even going to allow crew at all. We were like, and, and probably no crew at all. And then we had a few runners, you know, reach out to us and were saying, you know, how, how much they hoped we could reconsider the, you know, having crew, how much they rely on their crew and so on and so forth. And so after we kind of thought about it and talked about it a little bit, we we're like, okay, so maybe we can allow one crew per runner, um, at, at each aid station, but only one crew member can be allowed out of the car at the time and they will have to have a, a crew bib. So we printed off for each runner, they each got one pacer bib and they each got one crew bib. And so whoever whoever their crew or whoever their pacer was had to hand that off to whoever was going to be out of the, you know, with the runner. Um, but that's the only person that was going to be allowed, you know, either on course with the runner or at the aid station. They had to have a crew bib or a, a pacer bib. And again, everyone is very cooperative, and and and, um, and I didn't get any pushback from anybody. People were awesome. So so so, so how great. many how many people uh, started at the the hundred mile and fifty mile distance, and then what was your total participation on that that race day? Uh, so the hundred mile, we had about a hundred that did that one. Uh, the fifty mile, we had uh a little over a hundred uh it, it was to to be honest it was about a hundred for each distance a li- some of the so the the 50 mile and the 30k uh they had they had a little bit higher numbers but overall i think we were right around uh 550 ish okay. overall participants for that event uh over those five distances and uh and it was really, it was, like I said, we had, we had a campground there, the start and finish line that was on this, this rancher's property. And, uh, and it was pretty uh, awesome to see how everybody just kind of spread themselves out and, uh, and kind of, and kind of did their part to, to keep themselves socially distanced from everybody. And, and, um, uh, and then same thing, like when the race was finished, we had asked everybody, you know, like, Normally, we want you to hang around the finish line. We want you to congregate. We want you to cheer on everybody coming in. And uh, we just ask you this time under these circumstances to just get, you know, collect your awards and uh, and and go into the park or go do something else, but uh, but not not hang around the, the finish line. And so people were very, again, very uh, cooperative with that. And, and so you're talking about probably a thousand people besides your race crew, right? Because most, most of these people who are runners usually have, you know, the locals are, are going to have one or two of their family members or friends there with them, right? Yeah, because, yeah, a lot of the, the, especially the longer distances, they had multiple pacers with them and multiple crew members. And so, yeah, I'd say we had, you know, over a thousand people there between between runners and, and crew and pacers and spectators and stuff, so. Okay, so so pretty pretty good-sized crowd. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, super. And uh, once again, what were what have been what is you know we're a couple months down the road or a month and a half down the road from this, and and what have you heard? I I haven't heard anything. We sent out uh, we sent out a post race survey and uh, and you know and, and let everybody know if if they did uh, exhibit any symptoms or anything like that. Um, we we would definitely like to know that, you know, of course there's, there's privacy, you know, laws and stuff like that, uh, in place. So, you know, we, we definitely can't, you know, ask people to, uh, to inform us of that kind of stuff. But if somebody felt so inclined to reach out to us and let us know and, or else point the finger at us and say, I got this because of you guys, um, you know, I'm sure that would have happened and, and we haven't heard any of that. So, uh, I feel pretty confident and, And, you know, and quite honestly, you know, the fact that neither myself or any of my staff have have uh, come down with anything is is definitely, uh, you know, we we probably are in closer proximity to all those runners than the runners are to other runners, you know, so 
Um, so that, that says something there too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with the aid station job, big difference with this race, you had to do box state or how is that working? Yeah. So I, again, I, I don't know if, if that was necessarily something that we had to do. We felt kind of reiterating what I was saying earlier, we felt an obligation to put our best foot forward and try and try our best to try and keep things, um, as, as, sanitary and as uh clean as possible and and so the 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 thought process we had was let's just do you know single serve prepackaged kind of grab and go items that people can just grab that are all you know individually packaged and nobody needs to handle them so we don't have to worry about you know uh anybody feeling like this aid station worker wasn't sanitary or whatever it's all it's all prepackaged and and so typically at our races, we, we pride ourselves on being a zero waste or as much of a zero waste event as we can. We generally uh, don't even use, you know, paper cups and things like that. We, we, we use reusable cups and we wash them. And, uh, and so a lot of our, a lot of our aid stations require, you know, a pretty hands-on approach of like washing the dishes and, and then reusing them for runners and stuff. And then this, this go around, uh, we couldn't do that, and so uh, everything everything required a lot of a lot of packaged things, which created a lot of waste. But uh, we felt like that was, uh, you know, uh, worth the the amount of work that we were going to have to do to to separate and process this stuff just to just to keep everybody safe. And and uh, and and. You know, like I said earlier, you know, I sent out a post-race survey and that was not something that people really liked. They did not like the, the pre-packaged uh, grab-and-go stuff. They, they prefer to have, you know, bacon and potatoes and cut fruit and the, 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 tra you know. the, the traditional yeah. aid station. Yeah. Yeah, the traditional stuff. And so, uh, you know, we, we definitely listen to that, you know, and, and, and want to try and uh, accommodate that as best we can. Again, this is kind of, uh, you know, we were the first guinea pigs to do this, you know, post this, this, uh, coronavirus, you know, outbreak. And so we're just trying our best to, to try and figure out a way to make races happen again. And so that was something that we, that we did. And, and, uh, and for the most part, we, we strongly encouraged all of the runners that were running if they, if they felt like there was something that was critical to their racing experience to utilize their drop bags. And I think that that was definitely something that they took to heart and, uh, definitely utilized quite a bit. We had a lot of, a lot of drop bags that we had to transport to and from the aid stations and, uh, we were happy to do it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that was really something that, uh, um, people relied on a lot heavier than they usually do, uh, okay. at doing these ultras is their drop bags. So, yeah. So uh, once again, uh, and no, no, no blowback. Not a single case that's been brought to your mind of any COVID. Correct. Correct. Okay. Now, uh, have you communicated this to some of the permitting agencies you work with to, to reassure them? Of yeah. So I reached out to the uh, to the the county. Uh, I talked to them afterwards and let them know that. Uh, that uh, the race went really well and uh and that we haven't heard of any cases they were super uh happy and thrilled to to hear that uh i think that they're from their point of view going into this race and trying to give us the go-ahead they had a lot of apprehension themselves too just because you know even though even though they're a small community um they rely on tourism quite a bit for their livelihoods so like you know, even though they want to be safe and uh, and protected from the virus, they also are looking at this like, well, you know, we gotta at some point we gotta open our doors back up, and at some point we gotta we gotta start allowing people to come back into our community and and uh, so that we can so we can all survive. And I think right. that was kind of their their approach they were looking at with with our event was like, well, we're we're pretty dead in the water right now, and so um, with only you know, five to 600 people coming to this event. I think this is a manageable uh, event that we can, that we can uh, 
you know, start to bring some tourism dollars back into the community and, and, uh, get things going. So, um, so they were, they were super supportive of it. And then, you know, the same, same thing with the forest service, they were super happy and, and, uh, glad to hear that, uh, that the event went well and that we didn't have any, any, uh, fallback from it. So. And if you talk to the Navajo nation about the Antelope Canyon race you held too? No, I haven't just cause they haven't been in the office yet. So, but I've talked to several of the, uh, several of the landowners that, uh, that are members of the Navajo nation who, uh, who've, who've, uh, they're, they're doing fine. They, they just said, it's just, it's just been, it's just been hot, tough on their whole, on their whole, uh, community, uh, in general. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it hasn't been, it hasn't been due to you, your races. No, no, no. Yeah, for sure not. Yeah. They don't, cool. there's no, there's no finger point in there. Uh, it was, so, it was definitely something that was coming. It was starting to, and that was kind of why they made the decision in the first place was just the, the number of cases spiking on the reservation prior to our event. Uh, so let's, of, yeah, let's move this forward a little bit with, with, you know, since you guys really are the, you know, the ground zero or the, the, you know, you know how hey, you have the first case that brings it all in. Well, you guys are the first case in terms of putting races on in this new uh, world, this, putting ultras on in this new world of, of COVID. What are your thoughts? What are you and your team's thoughts, Salem, everybody in your team's thoughts about uh, moving forward, just in terms of the reality versus the theoretical thing? Because I, wanna, I want people to understand COVID is real. It's a hoax. It's is it a hoax? No, it's not a hoax. But is it the plague of death? Not unless you're over 70 or have a bad comorbidity. That's what the numbers are starting to show that, yes, it's highly transmissible, but it's very deadly for a certain population and not so much for others. And, and um, the problem is, is we're, we're doing a, a one size fits all thing. And, and yeah, we need yeah. to find a way to move forward because, you know, as as the Bryce Canyon community uh, where you held your race knew they were already facing economic death or they were already in economic death versus potential death. And, and I think that smart, well-held events, uh, especially by people who are super healthy, not tourists riding around in cars, uh, yeah. may present some opportunities, right? Absolutely. Uh, well, that's what I, that's, I mean, that's my opinion of it. I think that, uh, I think that in general, I think that, um, people, you know, healthy people are, are less susceptible to it in general because they're, they're doing good things. They're out there running. They're usually eating healthier. You know, they're just more mindful of their health. And, uh, and I think that that says a lot, you know, for, uh, for the type of people that are, that are coming to our events versus, you know, going to a, uh, a beer festival or something like that, where, where, you know, or, or a concert or whatever, you know, there's just, there's just definitely, uh, different, different groupings of people that, that, uh, to take into account when it comes to public gatherings. Well, well, not only that, but there's also the fact that when you're holding these races in places like this, you're outside in fresh air, sunlight, and, and these are now starting to become evident that these are, uh, things you can do to actually boost your immune system and reduce your risk of contracting COVID. And even if you are exposed, not getting a serious case. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you see, what do you guys see as in terms of moving forward? You, you are, you guys are going to continue to host races where you can, right? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's basically, that's the, the uh, the magic question right there is w where we can because uh you know we would love to just open up you know our our calendar and 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 continue to put on events but it really it really depends on on the local permitting agencies and the local community and, and whether or not they're supportive of it uh because we we don't want to do anything without the support of the local community. I mean, we're looking at we're looking at long term you know relationships with with uh, with these groups, and so we don't want to do anything to be like, hey, we have to come do this event this year, and then have them be like, yeah, you guys brought thousands of people here, and you infected our whole community with the coronavirus, and now we've got all these people that are sick and in the hospital and stuff, and it's and it's because it's because you guys are trying to push something that that quite honestly 
you should have you should have been more reserved and cautious going into this. And so that's definitely, you know, our, our first and foremost uh, priority is making sure that the local community and local permitting agencies are comfortable and accepting of us coming to the area. And if they are, then having a discussion with them, okay, how can we, how can we do this event and still keep your, your community safe and keep our runners safe and, and put on a good event and make sure that everybody has a good uh, experience with it. And so that's kind of, that's kind of our thought process. And so, so yeah, we, we, uh, we have opened up uh, some, some fall events that we didn't, uh, that we didn't have on the schedule or sorry, not fall uh, summer events that we did not have on the schedule um, to try and, to try and, uh, you know, give some, some op- options to, to our runners. Uh, we did after the week after we did our um, Bryce Kane Ultra, we did uh, we did we called it Zion at night. It was just a half marathon that we did in uh, just outside of Zion National Park. Uh, but we had we we opened up registration two weeks prior to the event, and we had uh, just just under 900 people that registered for that one. And uh, and we just staggered the start times throughout the entire night. So we started. Uh, 50 people at 7 p.m. and then start another 50 people at 8 p.m. another 50 people at 9 p.m. and so on and so forth throughout the night and then we did that for two nights and it was so well received that we decided we're going to do another one in September so we're going to do another uh, Zion at night uh, September uh, 18th and 19th and then uh, we had to cancel unfortunately we had to cancel our Zion Ultra event um, that was supposed to be in April. We had to cancel that because obviously April was right smack dab in the middle of all this craziness. But uh, uh, we decided we were gonna we were gonna open up a Zion Ultra event uh, in September. So we're gonna do that the following weekend after the Zion at Night one. We're gonna do the Zion Ultra, and uh, on September 26th, and we're gonna we're gonna have the 100k a 50 K and just a half marathon distance that we do with that. We're not going to do the hundred mile just to, just to kind of keep, keep it a single day event. Um, but that'll be a, that'll be a good one. And then the other, the other one that we've, uh, that we've, that we've launched that we're, uh, going to be doing is, uh, August 8th. We're going to be doing one up in Yellowstone, kind of the same format as the Zion at night, but because there's so many grizzly bears up in that, uh, part of the world, the Oops. forest service that we work with, there's not, not very comfortable with doing a night event in bear country. So we're going to just do that one throughout the day. We're going to just stagger it throughout the day and, and, uh, and do, doing, uh, it's just a half marathon event, but we'll be doing that one uh, on August state. So, and then, and then the rest of our schedule is all the same. Uh, we haven't changed any, anything else. There, there haven't been any other canceled events. Uh, we've got one that we're doing in two weeks up in Colorado, up in Estes park, Colorado. It's our Rocky mountain half marathon. So we're super excited about that, and um, so yeah, we're just we're just trying to to roll forward uh, with businesses as best we can. I wouldn't say business as usual because it's not as usual. No. That's one thing I've had to stress to all my uh, all my uh, race crew, all my staff working for me too, is like when we go into these events, it's like, hey, I just want to make sure you guys understand that that if you're going into this with the the mindset it's business as usual you're, you're sorely mistaken. This is not business as usual. This is, this is, we've thrown out the old playbook and we got a totally new one. Now we've got to, we got to do things a little bit differently to, to make sure that, uh, we're compliant and, uh, and also keeping the communities that we're running in and our runners and our participants safe. But, uh, but, uh, still, still, uh, you know, runners, uh, satisfaction is still our number one priority. So we want to make sure that, uh, that they have a good experience now. So with the Zion at night runs, uh, also, I, I, I know I'm beating this drum, but any, any fallout of that COVID fallout from that? No, no, nothing from that. Okay, good. I just want to keep beating that drum because, yeah, uh, no, people... I appreciate it. Cause it's, it definitely makes me feel good every time you ask that question when I can answer it that way too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and this is the thing It's like, like also I'm imagining from what you're saying here, the, the there's this pent up demand because people want to get out. They want to, they want to do an event. They want to train, they want to get healthy. And this is actually, 
I think what's going to emanate is is the healthier you are, the less this really is a, a thing. For sure, for sure. So, so is that true that there is a lot of demand? I mean, you're seeing that there's a pent up demand for for people for events there, like this. There definitely was. There definitely was because that was the other thing when we when we made the announcement that we were for sure going to roll forward with Bryce Canyon Ultra. Uh, I really think that if we had been greedy which I want to reiterate, we weren't, we, we definitely could have been, but we weren't, uh, if we had been greedy, we could have just left registration open. And I think a lot of people would have signed up for it just because they were desperate for events. But we, we, when we made the decision that we were going to do it, we shut registration down and, uh, and did not allow anybody, any new registrations for that one. And, uh, and so then when we, when we launched the Zion at night, um, like I said earlier, we did, we only did that two weeks prior to the event and, uh, and we had, you know, close to 900 people registered for it. And, uh, and so, which was great. Um, we, uh, we were, we were definitely happy to be able to, and I think a lot of people just, they just want to feel safe. You know, they want to, they want to still get out and do these events, but they want to see like, what's this race company doing to ensure that I'm going to be safe. Cause you know, you get, you get two different, uh, mindsets when it comes to this. Some people, uh, some people are concerned about it and others are, are not, but they, but they still want to want to continue to participate in these, in these type of, you know, running events. They want to get out and race again. And that was the, that was the overwhelming comment that I heard from almost everybody at Bryce Canyon that weekend was it just feels normal. It just, you know, it just makes life feel normal right now. And, and, um, um you know, when we were doing the Bryce Canyon race, this is when, uh, this was, you know, when, when all the rioting was going on too. And, and I was, you know, I was busy putting on the race. And so I was very disconnected with what was going on in the world. And I think every, all, all the participants that were coming that had been, um, you know, watching the news and stuff the day or two going, you know, prior to it, were just like, holy cow, it just feels so good to be here. And just like my world feels normal. And that was the thing they kept saying. And I'm like, yeah. It, it does feel nice to be back doing this stuff again for us too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the purpose for me interviewing you is, is we, we really need to show some leadership to um, not only make listeners who are athletes feel like, okay, there are people here actively trying to get races going. And, and that's not to say that other race directors aren't either because I probably the, the vast majority have taken the tack that, they're trying to put the races on, but the permitting agencies aren't going to let them. Yeah. Um, and I've had, I've had a number of race directors reach out to me and, uh, and, you know, and we've tried to, to give advice where, where we can to try and help them out. Cause it's definitely, I, you know, we feel, we feel, uh, uh, maybe this is not the right word, but an obligation. Uh, we, we definitely would love to see, uh, other race, you know, we don't feel threatened by other races. You know, we want to see, the racing industry uh, succeed and we want to see, we don't want to see any races going out of business because of, because of this, like we want to see uh, them continue to operate. And so um, whatever we can do to, to share what we've learned, uh, we're definitely, uh, we're definitely all for that. Well, we want to yeah. make sure that. Yeah. And I think, I think some races, some of the bigger races canceled too early. I heard Wasatch got canceled. Western States got canceled. Um, you know, Hard Rock got canceled. Um, a lot of these um, races canceled early before they even had an indication from the permitting agencies. And, and I, you know, I'll be the first to say I don't judge that because I don't know the inner workings of the decision making. But sure. um, I think those races canceling uh, was a big blow to the athletic community, you know, in terms of, of you know, we're already dealing with COVID. Um, yeah it's really about staying healthy and then you have nowhere to go. And, and that's, that's, you know, one of the things people are starting to see is the stress, the lack of exercise, the being indoors um, and, and not being outdoors in a natural environment like you guys are hosting is, is actually quite detrimental. Yeah. And I think that, you know, kind of going back to what you're saying right there, I think that for, it's definitely not a one, one size fits all type uh, situation when it comes to these events too, because some of yeah. those races you, you you mentioned, you know, they have lotteries and uh, and it's a it's a hard thing to get into some of those races. And so, 
you, you definitely have to take some of that stuff into account when, when you've got races that you have to qualify for, or, or it's, it's a lottery system, you know, or whatever, because, um, because of travel restrictions, right? So like if somebody, if somebody qualifies for Western States, for example, but they're in Canada or, or Europe or, you know, Asia and they can't, and they can't travel to it. Well, then it, it creates a whole nother, uh, you know, mess that uh, they got to try and deal with. And so I think, you know, taking all that into account, it's really easy for, for runners and participants to look at some of these races and say, say, Hey, well, these guys did it. How come you can do it? And it's like, well, it's not, again, like I said, it's not a, a one size fits no. all type situation, you know? And so there's a lot of things that, that me as a race director, I, I understand that now. Um, but from somebody, for somebody else who maybe doesn't have that insider perspective, you know, it's, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of things to take into account when it comes to, you know, making a decision to, to continue with an event or to cancel an event. And, and, uh, yeah. And so I don't, I, I definitely don't look down on anybody that's had to cancel an event. Uh, I, I, I actually feel really, really terrible because I know, <laughs> I know how hard it is. We've had to do, we've had to cancel six events this year. So I know, I know how hard it is to have to communicate that bad news to the runners and, uh, and, uh, and to see the disappointment on so many people's faces, you know, when, when they've trained so hard and they've planned for something that they can't do. So yeah, yeah, no, and I, I've done enough race directing myself for a local club that I used to belong to to know how many moving parts there are, and you're at the whim of these permitting agencies, and you just basically got to do, you know, it's hard to negotiate with them sometimes. You just got to do play by their rule book, right? Um, yeah, for sure. And the other part about being a race director is a thankless job. I mean, there's so many details, there's so many moving parts, and it's so dynamic. It's 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 crazy. Yeah, definitely can yeah. be at times. Yeah, so all you listeners out there who are athletes training for these races, being a race director and maybe, you know, a lieutenant to a race director, it's, it's a pretty – big thing they're doing to make these these kind of races happening these big endurance races whether it's an ultra or a trail run or a iron man or a half iron man um, a lot of moving parts so anything you'd yeah. like to leave us with um lyle i mean you're an athlete yourself and 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 you know where you think see where you know look in your crystal ball as somebody who's <laughs> actually actually making it happen in in this world right now um successful i mean that's what we're doing is we're trying to get your knowledge and and thoughts and perspective to help both the athletes um, move forward as yeah. well as race directors and everybody else yeah i'd say you know if I, i'd say i'd have like two two parts of advice you know one would be is if you're a race director looking to try and figure out a way to continue on with with hosting events is to uh is to make sure you're in constant communication with the, the permitting agencies and the, the local you know community that you're working with and make sure that uh, that your event is is welcomed you know again like I said earlier in this this uh, interview you know you want to make sure that you you trying to force uh, an issue you know force an event there uh, on an unwelcoming community uh, you know, is going to have detrimental long-term effects on, on your events. So you want to make sure that you're in communication. And, and if, and if the general, uh, you know, consensus from the community is that we don't want the event this year, you know, then, then I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try to push that, that situation at all. Um, but on the, on the flip side of that, if you, if you're a participant and you're looking for, you know, and you're frustrated that your events keep getting challenged, you know, canceled and stuff, I just, just find find some other avenue to um, to you know satisfy your your uh, your interests. You know, uh, for me this year, you know, I like what Peter said. You know, I, I'm an athlete. You know, I I've done I've done I've ran several ultras. I've ran uh, several triathlons. Uh, I've done I've done a lot of different ultra endurance type of events. And, uh, and I love the challenge and I definitely love the, uh, the, uh, uh, the camaraderie that you get with being around these, these large groups of people. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm definitely a people person, so I love to be around people. 
Um, and that's had the, that's changed this year a little bit. So I've had to look for other ways to, to satisfy my, my interests and stuff. And, uh, and so just, just finding ways to keep yourself occupied and entertained is, is definitely going to keep your, your sanity, uh, up and, and, and don't give up on it. You know, keep, keep training. We can always keep training, uh, whether we have a race to train for or not, you just never know when, uh, when an opportunity is going to present itself. Like I, like I was saying earlier, this, uh, Zion at night one, we launched that two weeks before. And so, you know, luckily, I mean, it's a half marathon, but like if, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, an, an ultra runner looking for ultras, uh, we, 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 you know, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, options still on the calendar, uh, this year, uh, especially some of the smaller, smaller, uh, more grassroots style events that, uh, that makes it a little bit easier for them to keep everybody socially distanced. So just keep your, uh, just keep your, 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 you know, your nose to the wheel there and, uh, and keep, uh, keep, keep training. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. And, uh, um, Lyle is with Vacation Races. That's vacationraces.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. Um, Lyle, thanks so much uh, for taking the time to being on this podcast and giving us your insights, perspective, and history, and um, leadership more than anything else in in showing the way forward in getting you know endurance events uh, back going. So uh, look forward to seeing you out there at some point. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Really appreciate you you having me on here, and I was excited to be able to talk about what we've experienced. So, yeah, well, I hope we can push this out there and, and get that going because I think I think hearing that these events are going on and there is no um, spread of COVID due to these events per se uh, is going to help reassure a lot of people because there's a lot of scared people out there. Uh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks again. You are listening to Food for Thought, the OFM podcast, sponsored by Vespa.